The Federal Reserve is known as the orchestrator of the world's largest economy. In this two-part series, you'll hear a conversation between former Fed Chairman Dr. Ben Bernanke, who served during the global financial crisis and is now a senior advisor at PIMCO, and Dr. Richard Clarida, who was the Fed Vice Chairman during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic and now is PIMCO's global economic advisor. In this episode, they'll reflect on their time at the Fed and share insights about PIMCO's investment process. A global financial crisis, a very stressful two years. The Fed, uh, you know, tried to deal with a financial system that was close to collapse globally. We did three things. We uh, provided a lot of uh, liquidity, cash against collateral, and not only for the banking system, which is what the Fed is supposed to do, but throughout the entire financial system and even some non-financial firms using various emergency powers. The second thing we did was we tried to prevent the collapse of major financial firms. And ultimately, we had to work with the Treasury and the Congress to pass the TARP bill that gave us capital that we could put into the banks and help them stabilize. That was really important. And then, uh, as, as Rich knows from, uh, from another crisis, uh, easy money can support an economy that needs help. And certainly, the financial crisis put us into a, a deep recession. So the Fed you know, cut interest rates to zero and began to undertake other kinds of policies you know, to try to provide some support for an economy that was uh, uh, hit very hard by that crisis. Well, hit hard, the, the pandemic collapse. You know, I, I, ben, I, used, I come to calling it the pandemic collapse, not, not crisis, it was a public health crisis, but we very much and very self-consciously pulled out the Bernanke uh, a, a pl playbook. Uh, you know, we cut rates to zero. We did a purchase program. Uh, we provided a lot of liquidity. In some cases, literally opening the file cabinets and, and taking off the taking out the facilities that you put in place. The challenge we faced is in the U.S. and globally, the entire economy was being shut down for public health reasons. And you're thinking, how do we operate a financial system if there are no revenues coming in to make coupon payments or pay workers or, or make lease payments? Uh, and so, you know, we had to go an additional step, which was to announce program to support the corporate bond market, and municipal bond market. I'm very proud of the fact that the Fed never wanted to be lender of first resort. We were the lender of last resort. Those facilities were priced out of the money. Uh, there was very little take up because private markets opened, which was the intent. Um, but a different crisis, but in many ways, we were able to benefit from what you did and then move into the announcing these programs that in the end, there very little take up, which we viewed as a success. Well, financial crisis is not a very uh, pleasant experience. Uh, there were a lot of, a lot of stressful uh, weekends and a lot of, uh, before war, Asia, what was it? Before, before Asia <laughs> opens, yeah. yeah. I was thinking of titling my memoirs Before Asia Opens because everything <laughs> had to happen by a certain time on Sunday evening before the Asian markets uh, opened. Uh, so that, of course, was was very difficult. And, and uh, then you had to have a, a fairly uh, good ego because, you know, there's a huge amount of criticism coming from the public and from Congress. And uh, I got to hear that firsthand when I testified before Congress, which I did more than 80 times when I was when I was chair. So uh, there's a lot of stresses involved. The, the positive side, I think, there, there are many positives, um, but one of them is that I, my background is, as is rich as, uh, is as academic. I was a professor for uh, 23 uh, years. And, uh, you know, we have, you know, the Fed has such a high quality of staff, you know, uh, PhD economists, uh, who can provide, you know, real uh, interesting uh, perspectives on on the issues that the Fed and policymakers have to confront. And I always found that, you know, really interesting. And I would often have conversations, you know, with, uh, with staff members just about what they were working on as opposed to something about the next meeting. Similar, I guess I'll highlight a couple things. Uh, one thing about the Fed of necessity um, is because of, of what you do, and where it fits into the economic and financial system, um, it can be a pretty lonely place. You can't go to cocktail. When people say, "What do you? What you do at the office today?" But what that means, given how intense it was, you know, and every day you were either making a decision or 
doing the analysis you'll need to make a decision that is not only setting monetary policy for the U.S., but for the global economy. So I found it to be a, a, a real bonding experience among the people I could talk to, because we all sort of realized the only people we could really talk to about what was on our mind were our colleagues, because you can't really share it with too many others. The, the part I missed the least was the last half of my time as vice chair was in the pandemic. And the Fed went very quickly in March of 2020 to work from home monetary policy. I think it's remarkable what we got done. In fact, in those days of March, Ben, the Fed staff had not gotten video conferencing to a level they felt uh, comfortable with. So we did all of that crisis stuff, more or less like you all were doing it on conference calls. Um, but I, but I, did, I did miss the interaction with, with colleagues, the face-to-face -face the last year and a half. One thing I like about you know working with PIMCO is that its decision process, in many ways, does parallel the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve's approach. I mean, because the the goal is uh, of the of the forums in particular is to try to uh, create a story about how the economy is and how it's going to evolve over the next three to five years, and how the political f uh, aspects, geopolitical aspects, uh, affect that. And once there's a, a well-defined uh, uh, and agreed upon sort of picture, outlook, together with all the risks and uncertainties that are around that, that provides the background for, uh, for investment decisions. And the Federal Reserve uh, operates uh, very much in the same way. The staff provide forecasts and alternative scenarios, and, and it's all discussed, and, and that's how policy is made. And, and one other thing, which I think is important, PIMCO brings in uh, outside, very good, high quality outside speakers who come in and give different perspectives. Um, the Fed doesn't do that quite <laughs> as formally, but but certainly uh, the board uh, and the FOMC meet with outside groups and and others who bring a, a different perspective, um, so that they can hear you know a, a different, perhaps uh, opposing view. Uh, before making a decision. Well, I would not disagree with that. I would point out one thing that Jay Powell and I did during my time there is we we sort of formalized that. We would have four or six times a year, we would, have, we would invite in outside groups, sometimes an academic group, sometimes folk with some market experience. You know, needless to say, the Fed was in listening mode. But mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing I would compliment, uh, uh, compliment your view on that is one thing that I enjoyed, and of course, it's a good thing since I'm charged with sort of overseeing the processes. PIMCO does both the cyclical four times a year, so looking ahead three to six months, and then does carve out one week a year to try to look ahead three to five uh, years. And that goes all the way back 40 plus uh, years ago. Um, um, and obviously we, we take it quite seriously. I've really seen the value of having frequent quarterly meetings and then once a year carving out time to do the three to five years. So I think it's, it's a good process. It served us well.